right. Thank so you. it would be great if we could just start with a little bit of background because um, mm -hmm. I think your background wasn't as an assistant originally and your story is really interesting because you came to being an assistant a really long way around. So why don't we just right. start with where you were from, what your family background was, that yeah. type of thing, and what your aspirations were as a kid. Okay. So uh, I grew up in, uh, on the eastern shore of Maryland, which is a tiny, tiny little town, about 3,000 people, um, three hours east of Baltimore, Washington, and Philadelphia on the Atlantic Ocean. So little teeny town. Um, my, my first aspiration was I wanted to be a cowboy. My second was an 18-wheeler truck driver, right? Long-haul trucker. Perfect. Um, yeah, <laughs> my mom was not super psyched, but uh, and also a surfer. So so really, th that was my aspiration. And then when I hit high school, I wanted to be in advertising. And then when I got to college, I wanted to write for Saturday Night Live. So really, that dream of being in comedy and writing for Saturday Night Live is what brought me to uh, New York City, which, of course, is where I got the first job as Maury Povich's personal assistant, meaning that was my first job as an assistant. And then um, from there, Jan Wenner at Rolling Stone, and from there, Oprah's chief of staff. So that's kind of the lineage of how I got into this line of work. Wonderful. Okay. So tell us a little bit about that journey. How did, how did you go from being, you know, with Bonnie Povich to Rolling Stone to Oprah? Uh-huh. Um, I got to New York and uh, through a series of contacts. So my younger sister's best friend's mother was best friends with someone who was an associate producer at the Maury Povich show. So also known as networking. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yes. I, I like to call it magic and miracles, you know, by opening up to the possibilities. When I told my, a friend of mine this whole story, my friend's husband, he said, Libby, that's called networking. So whether you call it magic and miracles or networking, it's all the same thing. It's apparently. the same, actually. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, opening up so that the connections can meet. So I got the job with Maury. I worked with him for three years. He and his wife were fantastic to me. And I was in a comfort zone. And I knew if I didn't get out of that comfort zone, I was not going to open up to the possibilities in my life. So I gave him a notice, hired someone, trained them, replaced myself, moved on, had another job at, uh, as an associate producer at some really not great TV show. I was not great in the job as associate producer. I got fired. At the time, it seemed horrible. And back, uh, looking back, hindsight is twenty twenty. I realized, oh my God, that was just the universe sending me in a different direction because being a produ television producer was not my calling, so to speak. So um, then I did odd jobs for two years. I tried comedy for two years in New York, improv, stand-up, sketch. Wow. I cleaned houses. Yeah. <laughs> While I was doing that, I was also cleaning houses and picking up odd jobs to make ends meet. Um, and this was after I was Maury's assistant. So just know if you're out there and you're an assistant and you have this great job and then you go on to do other things, it doesn't mean that you're on the wrong path. You're just getting re-course corrected, recalibrating to the right path, I believe. Um, and then while I was in the sketch comedy group and doing odd jobs on the side, uh, a friend said, oh, Jan Wenner is looking for a second assistant uh, in his executive office. And I went and I, I interviewed with Mary McDonald, who had been his assistant, I think, for 25 years at that point. Wow. And she was with him for a very long time. Then I started, I got that job. I started working with her. I learned so much from her, her being the first assistant, me the second assistant. So I learned so much about magazine publishing, how a magazine is put together, uh, how to be an executive assistant, a number one assistant from Mary, who was so good at her job. Yeah. And then from there, I'd been with Jan for about three years and just thought, I really don't want to be an assistant. I want to be in comedy. I got the, an interview at Saturday Night Live with the head writer. I walked out of that interview knowing I would never be a writer there at the time. This was oh. in the late 90s. But that's all you wanted to do forever, Libby, wasn't it? True. I love that you just said that. So that was my dream job, to write for Saturday Night Live. And that's what took me to New York. I I'm moving to New York because I'm going to get that job. And then I was taking, like I said, the stand-up and improv classes. And then here I am. It's my big moment. Uh, um, actually, Jan's partner got me the interview. 
at Saturday Night Live with the head writer there. It was just an informational interview. It wasn't like they were actually hiring. And I walked in and I met with them and just vi- I felt the vibe, the energy, and I just thought, I'm not going to be working here because it was all kind of white men in their 30s and 40s at the time. This was in, um, I think, 1999. Yeah. And this was way before Amy Poehler and um, Tina Fey. And and I just left there knowing this. I don't even have writing experience. So why are they going to hire me? This is not going to happen. So that's when I started sending writing submissions to the Rosie O'Donnell show. I thought she's a woman. She's gay. She's funny. I respect her. And I'm going to get a job there. So um, I was sending submissions for about 10 months and was telling everybody I knew I'm going to write for Rosie O'Donnell. That was not working. Right. So I was sending yeah. submissions probably once a month and I wasn't even getting a reply from the head writer. So I thought at one d- one day on the subway going to work to Rolling Stone, I just said, OK, clearly I am not meant to have this job. I said this prayer to the universe, God, whatever you want to call it. Everybody's calling it something different and fighting over what to call it. You and I have had that conversation. Yep. And, and they're missing the magic of it, right? And the point and the power of it. So I just said, okay, clearly you don't want me to have this job with Rosie. So whatever it is you, metaphorically, want me to do, I'm open to it. Every atom, cell, and molecule in my body, mind, soul, and spirit is open to it. Show me what it is. Be really clear. Shine a big, fat spotlight on it, and I'll do it. And I release that intention to the universe truly believing, keyword believing, that there was something else out there for me. It was not Saturday Night Live. It was not um, Rosie O'Donnell. So once I released that intention, that prayer, I think it was maybe four or five weeks later that the Oprah opportunity came in. And it came in through this networking group I'm still in to this day called NICA, New York Celebrity Assistance. And it came through a member in that group, Trish Peters, who at the time was Brian Gumbel's assistant of 20 years. The opportunity came to her from a recruiter. And and she said, oh, I love Brian and I've been with him for 20 years, but I'll put it out to this networking group that I'm in, NICA. And that's how the opportunity came to me through this networking group uh, called New York Celebrity Assistants. That's really interesting. I know that your mum had said to you about six months before that um, that you really ought to look at working for Oprah, yeah. but you weren't open to it, right? Right. Yeah, I think it was. It was so her, Oprah's magazine premiered on the newsstands, and I believe in synchronicity, as you and I have talked about dates, numbers, yeah. synchronicity. So on my birthday, on my thirty-fourth birthday, April seventeenth, two thousand. Uh, Oprah's magazine premiered on the newsstands. And I, at the time, would always take my day off, uh, my birthday off from work. So I went to the newsstands. I got her premiere issue, got my coffee, my croissant. I go home. And for four hours, I read every nook and cranny of that magazine. I just devoured it and loved it and was telling my mom how amazing Oprah's new magazine was, blah, blah, blah. So a month later, in May of 2000, out of the blue, she said, Libby, and this is, uh, what, six, five or six months before the job came to me. My mom said, why don't you send your resume to Oprah? And I said, Mom, first of all, whoever is Oprah's assistant, why would they ever leave, number one? And number two, I love my life in New York. I don't want to move to Chicago. You know, my girlfriend's in New York. My friends are in New York. I love my apartment in the West Village. I don't want to move. So to me, in hindsight, again, that was me just shutting off the universe, God, right? Like the opportunity came through my mother. Like, why don't you just send your resume to Oprah? And I just shut it down. I wasn't open. Because first of all, and again, anybody who's an assistant out there listening right now, I always say, choose your top three people that you want to work with. If you're not happy in your job right now, choose your dream scenario. Who do you want to work with? And send your resume to that person. Send it to the director of HR. Send it to their assistant even. Send one to the director of HR and one to the attention of their assistant. Because that person may get married, move out of town, get a promotion. You know what I mean? You never know. Um, Something happens or they're they're just burnt out and they decide to move on. And what happens? They're in charge of looking for their replacement. Um, That happened to me twice in my life. So so my mom sent me that idea. It came through her. I blew it off. 
I, I like to say I blew off God or I blew off the universe because it was speaking through my mother and I was just like, yeah, yeah, what do you know? You know? Yes. Um, and in what, and, and so it was, um, let's see, that was May, June, July, August, September, five months later, the opportunity came back again through this uh, NICA, the networking group, and Trish Peters that was in that group. So, because of recruiters. So, um, my point is when I look back, it was a month before my mother said that, that they actually started looking for a, a chief of staff for Oprah. Wow. The person who was in that role was no longer in that role. And they started looking and they contacted this recruiter who contacted Trish, who contacted Nika. So I love connecting the dots of how things work because it's just a perfect example of how the universe works and how when you open up to possibilities, that's where the magic happens. For sure. So let's um, talk a little bit about the actual interview. How did that go? Oh, yeah. You love this story, don't you? I love this story. You can see by my face I love this story. I know. I do too. I love this story. I kind of look back and go, wow. You know? Um, okay. So, so, so I, that, that opportunity came through NICA. I reached, I ultimately updated my resume the, that weekend, faxed it to the recruiter. We had a couple phone calls. Then I ended up talking on the phone with the um, president of Harpo and the director of HR. We had a conference call. It went really well. And then Tim, the president, Tim Bennett, the president of Harpo said, uh, Oprah's going to be in New York this next week. Can you meet her for drinks? Yes. So I got to the hotel early um, and at like, like a half an hour, 45 minutes early. And I found this quiet place in the lobby of this hotel. And I sat there and just did my, you know, three deep breaths and slow exhales. And I said, wow. I said this prayer, thank you, God, for bringing me to this moment in my life. Wow. Oh my God. I'm about to interview with Oprah Winfrey. This is amazing. And I said, if I am meant to have this role, please make it clear to her and make it clear to me, you know, that I'm the one for this position and help me to feel calm, cool and collected and confident flow through me, see with my eyes, listen with my ears, think with my thoughts, speak with my voice, experience with my heart, walk in my shoes, guide me, protect me. Amen. It's just a little intention prayer that I set out. And, um, and uh, then I just got up and went to the host and he said, you're the first one here. And he sat me at the table and I just felt really calm and it was super packed, this bar of this hotel where we were meeting. And um, this lounge area. And then Tim Bennett, the president of Harpo, came in and introduced himself. And he said, Oprah's on the line with President Clinton. And <laughs> she'll be right down. As you are. <laughs> As you are. And I, again, I had that mind. I said, oh, okay. You know, and in that moment in my head, I was thinking, oh, my God, I can't believe that this is happening. This was October 2000. The year was 2000. And then five minutes later, the whole room just went to this hush. And all I heard was whispers of, oh my God, there's Oprah, there's Oprah, that's Oprah Winfrey, that's Oprah. She came over, she introduced herself, and we sat down, and as you would expect, she made me feel just completely comfortable. Her energy, she's so comfortable in her skin that that energy ripples out. So I felt comfortable, Tim was great, the three of us were talking, we talked for about maybe 40 minutes. Hmm. And um, she asked me about my life, my family, what I was doing at work, um, how I liked the job, my, my career. And then she, then out of the blue, at about 40 minutes, she said, what's your plan? And I said, what do you mean, what's my plan? She said, you know, your life plan, your plan for your life. And in that moment, Lucy, I had that moment of, do I tell her what I think you're supposed to say in an interview, what I think Oprah wants to hear, or do I do I tell her the truth? And, and it wasn't even a, it was like, I had that passing thought and then I just went with the truth. And I said, well, the truth is, you know, uh, five, four or five weeks ago, I was thinking, I don't want to be an assistant anymore. I mean, actually a year ago, I, I told her a year ago, I was thinking, I, I don't want to be an assistant anymore. I moved to New York. So I want to be in comedy. Um, and I've been sending writing submissions to the Rosie O'Donnell show for 10 months and no one's responding. 
And so about four or five weeks ago, I said this prayer, okay, clearly you don't want me to have this job, whatever it is you want me to do. Every atom, cell, and molecule in my body, mind, spirit is open to it. Show me what it is, be really clear, and I'll do it. And here I am sitting with you having a glass of Chardonnay. So if you leave this interview and you feel like, she's the one for the position, I would be honored uh, to take it because I would be matching my seven years of an experience as an executive assistant with what I believe in passionately. And what I believe in passionately is what you are doing on your show and in your magazine and your foundation, helping women and girls throughout the world and um, helping give a voice to extraordinary people in the world, ordinary people and extraordinary people. And so if you leave this interview and you feel like I'm the one, then I would love to take it. But if you leave this interview and you feel like she's a nice, she's a nice woman, but she's not the right person for the job, that's okay too, because that just means that there's a better chief of staff, a better fit for you coming right around the corner. And if this isn't what the universe God has planned for me, I cannot wait to see what's next. <laughs> Yeah. And we just had, we just locked eyes for like 1001, 1002. And then she looked at Tim and said, okay, Tim, let's bring her to Chicago. Oh, wow. And then of course, you know, it wasn't like, like a neat little bow there. You know, I had to, Tim kind of was like, whoa, 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 let's, you know, bring Libby to Chicago and have her meet our folks and see the city. She's never been there. So there was a series of meetings that I went through in Chicago and then I ended up getting the job and I thought, I got it. I was thrilled. I picked up, I moved my life. I thought I'll stay for two or three years. And I ended up staying for 11 years until the end of the show and then hiring a new chief of staff and training that person for me to move on and do something else. So it was amazing. Lesson. It's a great lesson in being yourself. And, you yeah. know, that actually if the job is right for you, then you will get it as yourself. I get so many assistants that say to me, oh, I went on this interview and I so badly want it and I'm trying to be who they want me to be. And I said to them, but if you're trying to be what they want you to be, you're never going to be happy on a day-to-day -day basis. You've got exactly. to get it because you're yourself. Um, yeah. And by the way, that, you know, as we talk about that, it's true for everything in life. I mean, I'm still figuring that out as a 51-year-old. Uh, it's true for relationships too, right? You get into it, you start dating, you want to be all of it, you want to be all perfect or be who you think that person wants you to be or dress a certain way or act a certain way, or at least that was my experience. And then, you know, ultimately that person is thinking, then you want to be yourself because we always want to be ourselves. And the person's like, wait, who are you? I thought you were this person you were presenting in the beginning. So whether it's a job or a relationship or friendship or anything, it's so important to be yourself. And I'm still working on it at 51. I want to um, talk to you very slightly about being gay, because I know yeah. that um, with the Oprah interview, there was a question originally as to whether you would tell yes. her that that was the case. And yes. I know the way you went with that. So can you talk to us a bit about that? Yes. So um, my, it was actually my mother uh, who at the time, and again, I was 34. I came out when I was 27 and I knew I was gay my whole life. And it was really a struggle for me from 10th grade through to the point that I came out. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, so much so. For a lot of time, weren't you? Yeah. And, and so much so that, yeah, I just, you know, you're a kid and you, I mean, this, I was grew up in the 60s and 70s and 80s through high school. So it was like, it wasn't cool to be gay at that time. It wasn't as accepted as it was now. So even at 21, I tried to end my life, not consciously going out thinking, oh, I'm going to go end my life. But um, ultimately, after a night of a lot of drinking, uh, really tried to end my life in a drunk driving accident. And I don't, I say that now because it's so important, you know, yeah. Um, that whoever's feeling desperate at any point, whether it's you're gay and you're not out, or there's a million other reasons why people just feel hopeless, that I, I tell that story because it's so important to know that hopelessness is a passing microcosm, a, a, a micro cloud of darkness. It's passing. It's not just going to hover there over your life for the rest of your life. It's just passing. And I survived that accident, thank God, and that's why I share it today, to say that when you are feeling that desperate and hopeless, I promise you it is a passing moment in time. It's not the rest of your life. I mean, that was 21. I'm 
51 now. The, the past 30 years of my life have been absolutely extraordinary. I never could have dreamed. So back to what you were saying, it, I, I came out to my friends and family when I was 27. I'm now 34. I'm about to interview with Oprah. And my mom said, God bless her. She meant, you know, she said, Elizabeth, <laughs> if, yeah, if Oprah asks about your personal life, I don't think you should tell her that you're gay. And this was back in 2000, by the way, the year 2000. And I said, mom, I understand why you're saying that because you really want me to get this job. I really want this job. But if Oprah is not comfortable with gay people, then I am not the right chief of staff for her, mm -hmm. you know? And and that really came from my core. I was not prepared. I did not want to go back into the closet to get this job, even though I admired Oprah so much and I respected her so much. I thought, if she's not okay with a gay person, then I'm not the right person for the job. And my mom understood and said, you're absolutely right, you know. Um, and by the way, I have to say, my mother, that she was going through her own coming out process of a child I mean, a parent of a gay child. So parents even have a coming out process as well. And my mom wanted the best for me. So she, she was going through her process at that point. And by the way, she, she, my mom, my dad, my siblings, my friends and family were all wildly um, accepting and just so welcoming when I came out. So my mom to this day, that was a part of her process as well. Like she's so open Parents call her and say, my child just came out. Can I meet you for coffee? Uh, because she's such a great person and so open. And it, it just opened her up as well, my coming out. So she's super accepting. That's the point I wanted to make now. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah. All right, so let's move on. What was life like on a day-to-day -day basis with Oprah? I mean, obviously, mm. there would have been some days which were completely mad. But just on a normal mm. day in the office, what was that like? Mm. Uh, first of all, it was incredible because she is an incredible person. Her energy is palpable. So they used to say, when I first started working at Harpo, they used to say, you can feel when Oprah's in the, in the building. And it's, it's true. She had such a big energy and people just would come alive. She really brought out the best in people. So um, you could feel her energy. People were super amped up when she was there. So she would get there super early to work out in the morning um, and then, you know, go into hair and makeup, I think, like, you know, by 7 a.m. or some 7.30. So I managed a team of five assistants and they would alternate who would come in early. I would then come in, I think, around 8 or something to go in and brief her while she was getting hair and makeup done. We take two shows a day, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. That was pretty much our, our schedule. One show in the morning and one show in the afternoon. So I would go in, I would brief her. I had a document that our team would put together and manage. It was pages and pages of questions and updates. Can you hear the dogs bar barking I in can, the background? But that's okay. It's real life. Okay. It good. is real life. Exactly. I was like, wow, that's... That's really loud to me. Is it loud to you as well? It's not loud, but they are there in the background. But it's okay. 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 Thank I you. I think they stopped. Dog lovers in the house. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so anyway, uh, I would brief her. We just had pages of documents where on the top page, I think this is important for assistants to know, is it, it's such a meat and potatoes way of keeping track of stuff. But we would have the top three questions. So when you're, you know, her time was so valuable when you when we would be able when I was able to get in there in the morning to set up some get some things answered so that the rest of her life could move forward we would have the top three most pressing questions that absolutely had to be answered before she went down into taping and then if we had if I had more time I would continue down the list of questions and it was all chronological and or most uh, time sensitive so I would get as much information as I could from her. And then the producer would come in to brief her. And then I would exit, pull my team together in my office and go through all the information that I got and just delegate it out to the team. I was a super macro manager and just say, here you go. And if you have any questions, let me know. And then call other people that had to do with, you know, different business heads to give them the information so that things could move. Uh, so that was the most important part of the day connecting with her in the morning yeah. and then she would go down 
to do the show, I would close my office doors because I, it, was, it was these systems that I set up because when I came in, I was just bombarded by work and would work from about 6 a.m. until midnight, almost like Monday through Friday when I first started the first year, trying to get a handle on all of it. Yeah. Um, and then uh, so I, when the taping would start, I'd shut the door. I would go through emails. I got about 250 emails a day on average. Um, try to watch the taping. So I was in the loop on what was going on. The taping would end after an hour, open the doors, and then just I would start doing meetings all day long. And then when she would go into the hair and makeup chair for the second show, go back in, try to brief her, get some information, give her some updates, come back out, the same exact system. And then I was having meetings all day long and or on the phone. And then at the end of the night, she on average, she would probably leave between, I'd say, eight and nine, nine thirty at night. And then I would stay later to continue working on stuff where no one was in the office and I could just get stuff done. And then when she was traveling, I would travel with her. So that was maybe every other weekend ish. Wow. On average. That's a crazy lifestyle, Libby. Yeah. It was. And it was Good fun. fun though. <laughs> it was crazy uh time and everything, but worth it you know I mean I just I felt so fortunate and blessed to have been chosen for that position and to have that time with her and learning by her side and all the people I met and I I don't mean just people think that I met every celebrity on the show not at all I actually met very few because our executive offices were on the second floor the studio was downstairs and there was absolutely no reason for me to go into a green room and meet those celebrities. You know, I mean, there were tons of producers that were connecting with them and stuff like that. So it wasn't like I met uh, every single person who was on the show, but I did meet a lot of people. But I also am saying that all the people that I worked with, the, my coworkers, my the team that I worked with who were extraordinary, I wouldn't even be having this conversation with you or even doing talks at all on any stage if it were not for the team members that I had working with me. That was a group effort. It wasn't me, it was the team. Hmm. Um, as you know, I don't even know how to do an Excel spreadsheet, PowerPoint, I can barely do WordPerfect. <laughs> I mean, you know. I was going to bring that up. As an, yeah, as, 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 a, as an assistant, you have very, very little technical ability and I think that we love. <laughs> I know you do. People are shocked. Everyone in the audience is like, wait, how did you get that job? Here's what's so amazing. So when I was Jan's, when I was Maury Povich's assistant, his personal assistant, Jan Wenner's second assistant as an executive assistant, I really didn't enjoy, I, I enjoyed the people th that I worked with and learning, but I, went, I was always like, what am I doing in this role? I didn't understand it because I thought I want to be, you know, I was the person that wanted to be the truck driver the surfer, the cowboy. I always thought of myself as an artist or a traveler, not an executive assistant. And I failed typing in college, by the way. So it was always <laughs> so bizarre to me that I was in this line of work and I kept getting these jobs. And I did give it my best, but I didn't feel that I was excelling. Even when I left Rolling Stone, I felt like, I don't feel like I'm a very good assistant. But here's the key. I'm an excellent chief of staff. And Oprah and I had an excellent chemistry and connection so I could read her and then pivot you know and I would take the information and delegate it to the team who are so good at what they did I was an excellent energy person like knowing what she needed three steps ahead or reading her energy and understanding this is a good time to ask questions this is not a good time you know and really understanding her sensibility and what she needed in the moment but as far as executing administrative tasks, that is not my strong suit. So I felt so good in the role of chief of staff because I'm really good at that and I'm really good with people. But um, as far as executing, that's not that's why I didn't feel great as an assistant. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. All right. So tell me about a time where something went horribly, horribly wrong. And how yes. did you get out of that? Okay, this is, when I'm, when anybody asks me that question, this is always the number one that pops up. Um, so I was flying with Oprah and Gail and so, like, you know, her bodyguard and um, her hair and makeup team on her plane 
from Chicago to South Africa for the opening of her school in South Africa, which also happened to fall over the time of it was like uh, New Year's Eve and then the opening of her school. So she had invited all these VIPs from the United States to come over. You know, it was a very big deal. Were, so all, all these VVIPs, friends and family of hers coming to South Africa for the opening of the school and a big New Year's Eve celebration. It was just this long chunk of time. So we're flying. So Chicago, New York, we pick up Gail in New York. Then we're flying to, I think we, in this route, we were flying to Dakar. We would refuel in Dakar or something and then fly on to, or the Canary Islands actually, and then fly on to South Africa. Well, Halfway over the Atlantic Ocean, um, Oprah's sleeping in the back. I'm playing Scrabble with Gail. And I realize in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, oh, my God, I forgot my passport. Now, people might think, but how can you forget your passport because you're flying? But it, normally we had this whole system set up where, you know, you, you, I would say, do you have your passport to her? And she'd say, yes, in the office. And I have mine. And then we get in the car and the bodyguard would turn around and say, do you have your passports? Let me see them. Yes. And then we get out and we walk up to the plane and the pilots would say, hand me your passport. So no one would get on the plane, you know, prior to takeoff because it's a private plane. So you're not going through TSA security. Yeah. So um, all those lines of defense, for whatever reason, collapsed that day. And I realized, oh my God, I forgot my passport. I also realized that I forgot Oprah's passport. So I went back and I woke her and I said, I'm so sorry to wake you. Did, did you bring your passport? And she went, oh my God, I forgot my passport. I'm like, oh my God, I forgot mine too. I'm so sorry, you know. And and anyway, long story short, I was able to call the director of security who had done it in advance. He talked to someone, he talked to someone. It was all going to be okay. Once we landed, we could get off the plane and go to the hotel. And then the publicist was uh, Lisa Halliday was going to bring over the passports. Well, it turns out we land and whoever had given permission was not there. So after an 18 hour flight, we had to sit on the tarmac for six more hours until temporary passports were brought to us. And it was, I mean, the first, so again, we flown 18 hours with stops and everything. We sat there, I think the first three hours, I was just horrified. I was like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry, this is my fault. And she was like, Libby, it's okay. I'm an adult. I should remember my own passport. And I just kept apologizing. Well, by the time hour four, four and a half rolled around, <laughs> she was just like, oh my God, if my name was so-and-so, you're, you might be fired right now. You know, it was a joke. And I just, but that's the graciousness of Oprah. She did not fire me. Um, and that was a huge mistake. And, but, but it was okay. What I will say, my lesson in that is once you make a mistake, you apologize, you move on and you cannot grovel and be like, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry, which I was doing. And it was making it worse for her and for me. Um, you have to like pull your stuff together, be confident and move forward in confidence. Uh, just groveling makes it worse for everybody. Oh, Libby, I feel your pain. <laughs> yeah. Everybody does. Yeah. When I tell that story. Let's move on to something happier. What was a career yeah. highlight? God, there were so many. I have to say the career highlight was being able to manage her business and personal life and making sure that it was all smooth and, and in sync on a daily basis for 11 years. That, that is my career highlight. And by the way, again, I want to be very clear. That's because I had this fantastic team of four sometimes it was four and then it became five assistants together as a team we did that managing oprah winfrey's life and there were maybe uh when i left there were five and there were probably four assistants prior so let's say 10 total assistants during not all together at one time but there were 10 people throughout that 11 year time that i spent with oprah that were within the team of executive assistants managing and supporting and expediting all this, this massive information flow on a daily basis. To me, that is my absolute career highlight in my entire professional career. I mean, her life is mammoth. You know, we, we used to be in the car sometimes and, and uh, she would say, you know, wherever, she would say something like, what are you doing? Are you on your, 
who are you emailing? And we're talking here about work. I'm like, you don't even understand. That was kind of our joke because her imp impersonation of me would be, you don't understand what your life is like because how could she? Her mind would explode if she understood the amount of people and every nook and cranny of what had to happen for her to move, even in a car or the plane or the the travel, the meetings, you know, for her to say, hey, we're going to go to South Africa tomorrow instead of today. And I would say, no problem. Great. What time do you want wheels up? OK, good. You know, she didn't understand the amount of work that went behind the scenes in that yeah. one decision. So to me, to answer the question, the highlight was being able to manage her life successfully. And I mean life and all yes. the tentacles that came from that and all the family and friends and business associates and people, you know, on a daily basis asking for money or requests or will you be the co-chair of this or chair that or come see this. I mean, on a daily basis coming into that office. So the team and I to manage that was is to me the highlight. So, uh, as far as a personal thing, because I think what you're asking also that people like to hear would be um, uh, having a sleepover at Dr. Maya Angelou's house with, oh, wow. um, yeah, it was my partner at the time, um, my partner and I, and then Dr. Angelo and Oprah, and we just came to our house in North Carolina and had a chicken and dumpling dinner, and it was just the four of us, and then this amazing conversation and having a sleepover and just going, oh my God, this is amazing. I never in my life. So, right, I want to bring something back here. So at 21, it doesn't even have to be at age. At the darkest moment in my life where my brain, where my, I've been telling myself, I can't come out. I can't come out. This is, I might as well just end my life because what's the point? Now, here I am, cut two. That would have been, I was 49 years old, you know, with that sleepover. What had happened from 21 years old to 49 was so extraordinary and continues to be to this day that I want to, I think it's important to bring that back again. Whenever you're feeling depressed or dark or whatever, there's, yes. you don't know what life has planned for you, what God, source, the universe has plans for you. It's about just pushing through, reaching out to a friend for support because my God, my life has been extraordinary. You know, you know why I'm bringing that back. Yeah, I, I really do. And I so appreciate your honesty and, you know, the, the the authenticity of that statement, because I know that, you know, there are a lot of people out there who do go through depression, me included, actually. Me and, included. Yeah. You know, and it's and it's very, very real. And you're so yeah. right when it is dark like that to get a grip on that and to actually understand that it's part of a bigger picture is yeah. huge. And that just popped in to share it again. You never know who's watching this right now to hear both of us say, yeah, we get depressed or, you know, the times have gotten really dark. And the, and the message is there is something beyond. I promise you there is this beautiful life waiting for every single person, every single person. And let me just say, I mean, I've been on medication since 2010. And probably will be mm -hmm. for the rest of my life. But I kind of think of mm -hmm. it a bit like diabetes. I have a chemical imbalance and I have to mm -hmm. manage that. And look at the things that are happening for me in my life. It's so Oh my God. So yeah. being depressed doesn't actually need to define you. It is just part of your life. Exactly. Absolutely. I'm glad that came up. I feel like a lot of people need to hear that right now. Yeah, for sure. We're back to universe yeah, and God that stuff. <laughs> yes. Right. <laughs> Um, so 11 years and then you stopped. I think I know the answer, but why? <laughs> I was burnt out. I was absolutely burnt out. So Oprah had announced that she was ending the show and she gave a two year announcement. It was about two years from the time she said, okay, in two years, I'm ending the show in May, 2011. So this was in 2009. And I really thought about it. So I'd been with her for about nine years when she announced. And I just thought, I'm tired. I, I This has been amazing. And I've learned so much. And I absolutely love Oprah and my experience here. But I, and not but, and I need to move on. And I felt like with the travel and the amount of work 
And I had been through three relationships. I was in my third relationship at that point. It was very hard to sustain a, a relationship because I was either working or traveling. And when I was home, all I wanted to do was sit at home on a weekend in my pajamas. I didn't want to go out. I didn't want to do anything. I just wanted to sleep. And, and, and I was so tired of making executive decisions that I just wanted to watch like stupid TV and just mind, you know what I mean? Have some wine, drink, yeah. order in. I didn't want to cook. I didn't cook anyway, but you know, I just wanted to like <laughs> veg out, which is not a really fun partner. Um, when you have a free weekend. So, so anyway, I just thought it's time for me to move on. And my dream. So I, after Oprah announced a couple months after that, I said, look, I am with you until the end of the show. I'm going to help you transition out to California into the new network. When you feel settled, it is time for me to move on. And my dream is to stay in your Oprah universe in some capacity. I mean, that was my dream. My intention was to stay. And I just thought, I just, and I said, I just can't do this job anymore. I'm just, I, I'm burnt out. It's unsustainable. And she, and she understood. She said, you know, uh, this role at this level usually the burnout rate is about four years on average and you you will have done it for 11. So we've got two years, let's figure out what that was. And the truth is we couldn't figure it out. We had two years to figure out what my next role would be and things that she suggested were very generous, but I didn't see myself going in the um, executive network, t TV network path at all. I had seen mm -hmm. enough of it and realized, whoa, 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 this is not for me. Yeah. Um, and the things that I suggested, she was like, well, that sounds like a friend. <laughs> so I thought, well, maybe we're just supposed to be friends, you know? I mean, I really, because I wasn't even sure what my role would be. If I was not her chief of staff managing her life, what, what would I do? Because to me, that was the best role. And everything yes. that I saw in her life, that was the best role. And I was burnt. So we, you know, we just decided, okay, then I'm going to move on. I just thought, you know, it's time for me to go. And I remember saying to her, Lucy, that when the when we had that initial conversation and we were working out to, side by side uh, on like a treadmill, and I said, uh, you know, and I feel like if we can't agree on what the role is, then that's just God, the universe saying, you need to go out and share this experience in another way. And I said that, but I didn't really think that was going to happen. I did believe that because I believe when you can't, it was like me trying to get the Rosie job. I wasn't supposed to get that job. I was supposed to be working with Oprah. So when I said that to her, like, if we can't agree on what the role is, then I guess that's God universe saying you need to go out and share this in another way, which now five and a half years later, I see exactly, yes, how I am sharing it, doing talks around the world and coaching people one-on-one. -on -one. But at the time, I just thought, of course, we'll figure something out. And I'm sure Oprah th thought the same thing, but we didn't. And I think we were both surprised that we couldn't agree on a role. So when I left, I was excited because I was like, whoa, I feel like I'm on vacation. But I also thought, wow, I can't believe that we couldn't agree on a role. And that's yes. what led into my Libby Moore Gypsy tour and everything that unfolded from there. What advice did you give to the new assistant? The, the number one piece of advice was you must create a work-life balance because otherwise you're just going to burn out. And I do believe it's possible to do that. I went, I started and I went all in so hard. Like it's, it's hard to go all in a thousand percent of the time and then pull back because people are like, what are you doing now? You know what I mean? Yeah. If you have a balance and you set certain boundaries in the beginning, that's just how you work and they see you're doing a good job and you have balance and great, that's how Libby works. But I was just like, like exploded, like just gave everything. And I wouldn't, that's a whole nother conversation. I wouldn't necessarily say that's the best thing for them or for you. Because you're depleted. And Oprah used to say to me all the time, Libby, you have to you have to get up and leave your desk. It would be like 10 o'clock at night. She's going home. And I'm like, but I have so much to do. And she said, that will never stop. It's going to come in. Work will always come in 24-7 until the day we all die. But you have to manage your own workflow. But I didn't know how to do that so well, you know? So, but Libby, um, that's partly you. I mean, I, I think, you know, you are just so full of energy and you know, all that stuff. And you wouldn't be you if you didn't go at everything a million miles an hour. You know, it's, 
it's just the well, way that you well, are. You know, well, I would say this. I mean, my life is so extremely different right now. I mean, the extreme where I go to bed when my body's tired. I get up when my body is ready to get up. I don't do coaching calls before. I think 10 a.m. is usually my first coaching call. 4 p.m. is my last one. I have a lot of free time because that is the life I wanted to create for myself. So that's what I do, you know. Um, But it's dramatically different than it was before. I'm not interested in all in now at all. No. No. Um, I know. Thank you. (laughs) Real life. I just got tea. Hey, thank you. And I've been drinking tea. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yay. Hey. Um, <laughs> what I wanted to ask you was, I know that you have put into South by Southwest to do a mm. um, two-hander mm. with Zelda Lakonji, who was yes. my dentist assistant, and I'm really yes. excited about that idea. Is that yes. something? I mean, I know you two are really good friends. Is that something you're yeah. looking at doing elsewhere, or is that just a project that you put in for South by Southwest? Well, first of all, thank you for bringing that up. I appreciate you bringing that up. And a big thank you to Vicky because there was a whole group of us that submitted to South by Southwest because of Vicky. And she here she is going through cancer treatments, radiation, oh, everything. Know. And she's emailing us like, you guys, you need to get it in. And I made this mistake. Do this and check out this link. I, it was unbelievable. So thank you to Vicky for that. She inspired Zelda and I. And so, um, yeah, we want to do this duo. And it's about... Zelda was was uh, was with President Mandela for twenty years, basically, right yeah. until his death. Yeah. And I was with Oprah for eleven. And so we thought, what about we bring together our insights from those two worlds of those extraordinary people, Oprah and Mandela, and to bring our insight not only to executive assistants, to but C- to CEOs, to presidents, to entrepreneurs, to any human being, because Oprah and Mandela our humanity. It's about humanity. So there's no, it's the, the insights that we both gathered from that we're bringing together to share with the, the group, with the audience. And we do want to take that around the world. Amazing. Good. So we shall look forward to that. Yes. And other than that, Libby, what's next for you? I mean, I know that you're doing your coaching. I know mm-hmm. you're speaking all over the world, doing things like this with me. Is that an ongoing thing or are there any other plans in the pipeline? I love it. So, you know me, I'm not on Facebook. I'm not on Twitter. I, I, ha- I stopped reading the news July 6th because I felt like they're of, of last year, by the way. So it's been over a year. I read the most important things come to me within three to 24 hours organically. And if I'm interested, I'll go and read online about that. But so I'm managing my own news flow instead of, of it just bombarding me. So I've been working on all these different experiences. I haven't had a TV in over three years now. I love it. Um, I'm really not on social media. I have a website, LibbyMoore.com. I'm on Instagram, LibbyMoore Gypsy Tour, which I haven't posted in about three months. So I'm just, you know, I'm I'm doing the individual coaching. I love, love, love speaking all over the world. That's really what I'm focused on this year and next year. Um, And I have some other creative projects that I'm working on right now that I can't really talk about. And I'm open to creative collaboration. So if people... Um, go to my website and see my experience and think that my experience can help enhance their business, then I'm really interested in that. I'm interested in taking on a few select companies and coaching the company as if it's an individual. So even down to the granular that um, I think, for example, Google was launched in September of September. I don't remember what, but I know that if you were to look at the date horse as a horoscope, Google would be a Virgo. So what are the traits of a Virgo? Very practical, you know, things like that. So really out of the box, pioneering thinking of how do you work with a company that is not traditional coaching? I am not a traditional coach at all. Um, and how do you work with that company energetically, helping them realign to their highest self, highest intention, and what happens metric on the bottom line by doing that with them? But it's the opposite of traditional coaching. That's I, I don't do that. That's not my thing. There's amazing traditional coaches out there. That's not my thing. That's just been an absolutely amazing hour of interview. Libby Moore, thank you very, very much indeed for your time. <laughs>